want to start the presentation uh, by thanking you know, Christian and the selection committee for this award. It's a great honor, it's humbling. Uh, the fact that it comes from a conference that is so close to my heart uh, uh, makes it very special. I also have to say that unfortunately, Chris Parney could not be here today, but I would like to make it clear from the get go that this work uh, would not have happened uh, without Chris. So uh, I'm representing here, uh, him here as well. So we received this award for our ISTA 2011 paper entitled, Are Automated Debugging Techniques Actually Helping Programmers? And what I want to show you in addition to the paper is the first slide of the original talk. And both for historical reasons, but also to show you that Chris and I haven't aged a bit in 10 years, as I'm sure you can assess on the picture. And uh, if you remember, uh, Easter 2011 was in beautiful Toronto, Canada. So what I'm gonna try to do today is to take you on a trip through space and time, if you wish, between Toronto in 2011 and uh, Aros, Denmark uh, today in 2021. Unfortunately, it's going to be a virtual trip, uh, but we're trying to make the best of it. And we're gonna have to start by remembering what else was happening in 2011, because it's always good to kind of break the ice by putting things into an historical context. So not everybody might remember or know that 2011 is the year in which the world population surpassed the 7 billion. And on more mundane news is also the year in which Prince William and Catherine Middleton got married. And uh, I don't know, maybe Christian was there. And uh, that's also the year uh, when we realized that all we were going to see from that point on were superhero movies. But luckily, uh, there was a kind of a glimpse of hope uh, because Hollywood also showed some sign of interest for computer science. So there you go. And uh, at ISTA, in the meanwhile, we had uh, Medwire General Sharing, Frank Tip uh, Program Sharing, and you can see them here in all of their glory. And as it is customary at conferences, Chris and I were smoothing. And uh, I have some visual props to help you spot us because the quality of the pictures is uh, definitely not the best. But you can, you can see up there, you can probably recognize also other people uh, in the audience. And before moving to the technical part of the talk, uh, I would like to present some history and trivia uh, about the paper. So what I did, I basically dug through my uh, email and files. Uh, and the first thing I found was an email from March 2005 to Chris, when I'm still called Christopher back then, which shows that there were some issues with this application to a PhD program. So basically this paper might have never happened due to a clerical uh, error. I also find the email that I sent to the participants with instructions for one of the studies, uh, the confirmation of the PISFA order that we gave to the participant to motivate them. Uh, I found an email from Chris uh, the, the day of one of the studies that was telling me that everything went well and was gonna look at the data. And uh, interestingly, I found a, a, a snapshot that I sent uh, to Chris with some comments on the paper, where you can see that the original title of the paper was, my debugging aid tool needs help, insights into building better debugging aids from programmers. I'm glad that we came to our senses and we went for the current title, which is much more catchy and much more to the point. And the last thing I want to mention uh, in terms of trivia is the fact that I was not in Atlanta when we submitted the paper, <clears throat> but I was actually in London at a wedding, as you can see from the name tag here. And I wouldn't mention this if it weren't that the wedding was particularly interesting because the groom was nothing less than David Rosenblum, which is a long time and important member of the ISTA community and should know better than uh, scheduling his wedding the day of the Easter deadline. And uh, so it's, you can see him here uh, cutting the, uh, the, the, kid, uh, the cake, uh, the wedding cake uh, with uh, Rosie, his wife. And as you may imagine, I had to skip the after party, but it was all worth it because uh, then we received this notification that was telling us that, that the paper was accepted. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, we received very positive reviews, so we were very glad about that. And we received an even better reception at the conference. Uh, and in fact, I'm just gonna uh, show you here an email that I got after the presentation uh, from Lionel Brian that was basically you know, congratulating us for the work and also telling us that it resonated uh, with him and with his experience with uh, industry. And if you know how much Lionel cares for impact and relevance of software engineering research, you can imagine how flattered we were by this message that we keep around to this day. But I'm digressing because today we are here to talk about automated debugging. So I'm gonna start by giving you an example of what automated debugging is. <clears throat> Opening the cooperation on my machine. And there you go. So of course, you know, as many of you realize that this is not a real failure. Uh, this is a simulated one. Of course, it's taken from a real one. Everybody experienced that. But this is really the perfect example to introduce automated debugging. Because when something like this happens, uh, and normally, you know, you will click the OK button and you will get a chance to submit a, a bug report. And the, the dream and the idea of automated debugging, and instead of this, if you are a developer, you will have this magic button called debug, 
you'll push the button, machine will go off, do some analysis, and come back with a perfect diagnosis. And it will tell you, okay, this is where your bug is. Okay, and, and that's, that's really, you know, the whole idea. So the rest of the talk is gonna divide, be divided in three main parts. I'm gonna first uh, talk about the past, which is the history of debugging before and that led to our paper. I'm gonna talk about the present, and this is the present in 2011, where basically the time when we did this work. And I'm gonna talk about the future, uh, where I will discuss uh, basically uh, the automated debugging research that came after our paper and the impact of our work. And I also uh, mention some uh, kind of open issues that are still relevant uh, today. So let me start with the past by giving you a short history of debugging. And I'm gonna to start from the first reference to software errors. And I typically ask the audience, uh, in this case, that we don't have that interactive setting. So uh, I'm just gonna tell you that it might surprise you, uh, at least some of you, that uh, the first reference was in 1843, when software errors were mentioned in Ada Byron's notes on Charles Babbage's analytical engine. Then uh, in 1947, there is the event that many remember, uh, at least people working on debugging will remember, there was the first actual bug, an actual debugging, uh, that happened uh, in the group of uh, Admiral Grace Hopper. They were working on the Mark II computer at Harvard University. There was a failure, and they realized that the failure was due to a moth that was sitting in one of the relays. So here you see the, the bug report with the moth actually taped on the, on the report. Okay, so after this uh, you know, discussion of the roots uh, of the debugging, uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna discuss what I think are some of the main breakthroughs in debugging research. And for each of them, I will present the main intuition and quickly illustrate the approach. So I'm gonna start with program slicing. And the intuition here is that developers slice backward when debugging. So basically they, they look at where the manifestation of the error is and then they go backwards slicing through the code. Uh, the idea was presented by Mark Weiser uh, in a paper that was suitably entitled Program uh, Slicer, Slicing. And um, it was presented in 1981. And I'm gonna illustrate how program slicing works using an example. And uh, notice that I'm gonna use these examples for multiple techniques, so you only have to look at, uh, uh, at one. So th this is a program that takes three numbers, uh, gives you back the middle value. And if you look at line seven, uh, there is a bug there because instead of being M equal to X, uh, uh, we have M equal to Y probably due to a copy and paste error. And I would also like to point out to be completely clear that normally you don't have a comment that tells you where the bug is which will make debugging much easier. So this is just for the sake of the example, of course. Okay, so how will the uh, slicing work? So the, we will start from the place where the uh, bug is observed, the, the, the failure is observed. In this case, uh, is the, the statement uh, 13 printing the value of M. And then we will start looking at uh, all the statements that might determine the value of M at line 13. And uh, in that case, uh, what we mean, we will include uh, all the statements are lighted here. Then we might look at statements uh, that cause this statement to be uh, executed. For example, for line 12, uh, line one, 11 will be responsible for that, that if statement, it will include that. So basically we will continue following transitively these data and control dependencies until we include all the statements that might affect directly or indirectly the value of N and line 13. And one problem with slicing is that as you can see here, it tended to include the majority of the program. So that's why people uh, to alleviate the, program, uh, the problem uh, proposed uh, an alternative approach called dynamic slicing in which uh, you slice but you do it based on what was executed uh, in the program. So Corel and Lasky proposed it in 1988 and then Agarwal in 1993 proposed to use that for debugging. And in order to illustrate uh, how the dynamic slicing works, I'm gonna kind of uh, add some information to uh, our uh, initial example so I'm gonna first uh, uh, add in test inputs. So test cases, in this case, for example, we have an input which is three, three, and five. Then I'm gonna add the pass and fail information that tells us whether the execution uh, behaved correctly for that input or not. And I'm gonna add coverage information that tells you which statements are the ones with the dot were executed by that uh, uh, input. And in this case, uh, we're gonna use six tests, uh, five passes, and one fails. So how will dynamic uh, slicing work here? We will start from line 13 again, as we did for static slicing. And in this case, though, we will be following only data and control dependencies that were actually executed. So without going through the steps, uh, uh, this is what we will get. Uh, and as you can see, that's you know, much better than what we had before, it's a smaller part of the program. But uh, on the other hand, we're working out of a trace here. So you can see that we're still including most of the trace. 
And so let me see you know, how people kind of uh, address also this issue. And I'm just gonna mention one technique, uh, which is the last one I wanna mention in this arena, which is Y-Line. Uh, Y-Line uh, was presented by Amy Cohen, Brad Myers, and uh, in their ICSI 2008 paper, the title was uh, Debugging Reinvented, Asking and Answering Why and Why Not Questions About Program Behavior. So basically Y-Line allowed the developers to ask questions about the failure and incrementally investigate the causes of the failures until the root cause was found. I'm just gonna show you with a quick example. <clears throat> Imagine that you have this program, it's a drawing program. And uh, this line uh, uh, that you see, um, the, the, the kind of black circle, it's supposed to be blue. And so what Y line will allow the developers to do uh, intuitively is to ask the question, for example, why is the color black? And then it will allow them to ask further questions uh, once they get to the code that shows why the color was black and basically navigate dependencies until, as I was saying before, they, found, uh, they find the bug. So basically what Y line is, is a version of dynamic slicing on steroids, as I like to say. And it addresses the issue that most of the program is included in a slice by operating incrementally and letting the user drive the exploration. And the reason why I always mention this when I talk about debugging is because I really like this approach. And I like it because uh, it shows two things. First, uh, that often you do not have to reinvent the wheel to define a powerful technique. So you can leverage existing ones. And the second one is the importance of defining your approach with the users in mind which is something that I will get back to later in the talk. So it was not surprising to me that this work won an ICSI uh, 10 year most influential paper award. Next technique I wanna mention, a uh, breakthrough technique is Delta debugging. Uh, in this case, the intuition is it's all about the differences as is well you know, shown by the title of uh, Andrea Zeller's uh, paper in 1999. Yesterday my program worked, today it does not, why? And um, <clears throat> I'm gonna illustrate uh, Delta debugging in this case, uh, not with an example, but intuitively, <clears throat> sorry. So imagine that you have two versions of the program. The one uh, that fails a test, uh, which is today's version, and uh, the previous version, uh, that the one from yesterday, that passes the test. So Delta debugging basically does some sort of binary search. Uh, so we will take half of the program that fails and half of the program that passes. We will run it and check uh, whether it passes or fails. And if the execution passes, that must mean that the error is in the part that you did not replace. So you do the same for that part. And you continue basically this process, moving uh, you know, these partial programs up uh, uh, on the stack of passing or failing programs, further refining until you find a one minimal change that is responsible for the failure. And that is by definition your failure uh, cost. Uh, Delta debugging was extremely successful. Uh, it was applied in many ways to programs, input state, uh, uh, many people uh, derived uh, variations of the technique. So uh, again, an extremely successful technique that is used nowadays both uh, uh, you know, for research and uh, also uh, in practice. And that's when we get to statistical debugging, which is kind of the, the core technique for today's talk. And here, the key intuition was a great one, which was that debugging techniques that we've seen so far operate on a single execution typically. So there's a failing execution, you analyze it in some form and you find the problem. But there's actually much more information than that laying around because normally you have multiple test cases, some passing, some failing. So the idea for statistical debugging is that we can leverage this information we can, so that debugging techniques can actually leverage these multiple executions to uh, uh, you know, help uh, the debugging process. This idea was introduced in 2001 by Jim Jones, uh, the late Mary Jean Harold and John Tesco in a paper that was presented at ICSI 2002 with the title, <clears throat> Visualization of Information to Assist Fall Localization. And in case you wonder, the name of the technique was tarantula and it, it was called tarantula because tarantulas kill bugs. So there you have it. So how does tarantula work? We're gonna bring back uh, our example that uh, we used before. So the, the key idea is that for each statement in the faulty program, you compute a suspiciousness value that tells you how likely is that statement uh, to be responsible for the failures that you observe. This is computed through a formula that has two main components, a negative component that is proportional to suspiciousness and a positive component that is inversely proportional to suspiciousness. And uh, the negative components consist of uh, the number of failing test cases going through that statement, which is very intuitive, right? The, the higher the number of test failing test cases going through a statement, the more likely that the statement is faulty. And uh, this, notice that this value is divided by the number of total failing test cases, which gives you sort of the strength uh, of the signal, the support uh, 
because of course it's different if you have 10 out of 10 million test cases uh, that are failing passing through the statement that if you have 10 out of 11 of the failing test cases going through the statement. So the signal is uh, as a different strength. And uh, as far as the positive component is concerned, uh, this is computed in a similar way by uh, based on the number of passing test cases that are going through the statement. Again, it's very intuitive. The higher the number of test cases going through the statement, uh, the more likely the statement is not faulty. And it, also in this case, we divide by the total number of, of passing test cases in order to determine the strength of the, of the signal. So uh, how will suspicion work for this example? Uh, look at the first line. Uh, you can see that you have one out of one failing test cases going through the statement, five out of five passing test cases going through the statement. So you will get uh, uh, 0 0.5 as suspicion as value, kind of in the middle. If we look at the faulty one, you will have that you have one out of one failing test cases uh, going through the statement, one out of five passing test cases uh, going through the statement. So the value will be 0 0.8. And you can do the same for all the other statements and you get your basically ranked list of statements. And uh, the way in which you do uh, the exploration will be you start from the most suspicious uh, one. And if you find the bug there, you will stop and otherwise you will continue and look at the next one and then the next one and so on until you find the, the, the root cause. And in, in this case, uh, the technique will basically identify as the first entry <clears throat> in the ranked list the, the faulty uh, statement. So the, 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 this technique was extremely successful. Uh, John, Harold, and Seasco won several awards for this work, including an ACM 6 uh, Impact Award. Uh, and in general, uh, you know, many, many people like the idea and built uh, on, uh, on this, as I will kind of uh, mention more uh, later. Uh, another interesting technique in this arena that I want to mention is cooperative bug isolation, or CBI, by Lively, Nike, Zenga, Eichen, and Jordan. And what CBI did was to apply the idea of statistical debugging to deployed software, where the information about passing and failing execution uh, is coming from real users instead of uh, from tests. And this was a very interesting idea because you, know, you were able to leverage this whole wealth of information for your debugging process. So basically what it's doing is leveraging the power of the crowd before crowdsourcing was even a thing. So very ahead of its time. And the last technique I wanna mention here uh, specifically uh, is OKI by Abreu and colleagues. Uh, uh, which performs statistical debugging using a, a different formula that was adapted from molecular biology. So what happened is that, you know, at some point, uh, people really started to kind of pick up the idea and countless techniques were presented that built uh, on the original idea of statistical debugging and tried to improve its effectiveness by proposing either variations of the formula or variations of, of the approach. And so we got to the point that there were basically no software engineering conference that did not receive at least a dozen of submissions about new statistical poll localization approaches. And this was basically the main motivation for our ESA 2011 work as we, we saw so much effort invested in this direction. And we're not convinced that uh, we as a community were addressing the fundamental questions about the effectiveness of these approaches, which brings us to the present or uh, you know, what was the present in 2011 really. So uh, we, we started, thinking about the question, can we really debug at the push of a button uh, now that we have all these techniques? So let me revisit the conceptual model behind uh, these techniques that I just discussed uh, that they, and they were so popular at the time. So automated debugging uh, rank based. So you have a faulty program, you have the developer, you pass the program to the tool together with uh, some executions. The tool produces a rank list of statements uh, for the developer. The developer uh, will check this uh, uh, statement one by one and until basically they find uh, the bug. So we go through the list and at some point, uh, yay, they found the bug and uh, they are done. So how does this, how this, this technique uh, work in practice? Uh, what I'm showing here is the results of one of the early evaluations of one of these approaches. It was performed uh, on the, the space program, which uh, I mean, details don't really matter, but it's an interpreter for an array definition language, came with versions and, and, uh, and uh, uh, buggy versions and test cases. And the Siemens suite was the second benchmark, uh, which is a set of seven programs uh, also coming with bugs uh, uh, and test cases. And uh, the, the, the Siemens test suite was widely used at the time when all the benchmarks that are, we are commonly using today did not exist uh, at all. So it was a pre-GitHub uh, uh, time, <clears throat> so to speak. Uh, before I show you the results, I'm just gonna tell you, you know, what the graph shows. On the y-axis, you have the percentage of faulty versions of percentage of, uh, of bugs. 
And on the x-axis, you have the percentage of the program to be examined to find the fault. So you can imagine this being representative of the effort that has to be put into debugging. So ideally, you want to have kind of on the left end of the graph here, because you want to identify most of the bugs with the smallest possible effort. So how did this work in practice? Here I'm showing you the results for these benchmarks. And you know, looks pretty well, the, the, the curves as a, are as we will want them. And in particular, if we look at the space program, we can see that for more than 80% of the bugs, uh, developers had to uh, examine only 10% or less than 10% of the program to find the bug. So this is a, a you know, great result. Uh, people claim victory. But what did really mission accomplished? So we, we started looking at these techniques and results with uh, more of a critical eye and realized that they were based on some fairly strong uh, assumptions. The first assumption is that locating a bug in 10% of the code or so <clears throat> is a great result. And that, you know, this might be true if you have a kind of a small program, because if you have 100 lines of code, uh, you have to look at 10 lines, that's great. Uh, if you have a slightly larger program, <clears throat> like even just 10,000 lines of code, you have to look at 1,000 lines of code. And that might not be so great. And as soon as we go to more realistic programs, uh, you really have to look at a lot of code because, before finding the bug. So we found that you know, this assumption was a little strong. Second assumption is that programmers exhibit perfect bug understanding, which means that basically they can look at one line of code in isolation <clears throat> without context, and they can tell you exactly uh, whether that's a bug or not in a short time. And uh, to, to kind of cover this, I'm gonna use an analogy. I'm gonna show you this picture. And uh, if I ask you here, if you see a bug, yeah, maybe you'll see it, but it's pretty blended uh, kind of into the surroundings, right? And when I give a, you know, I gave a you know, kind of previous version of this, uh, uh, talk, uh, somebody was complaining, oh, that's not really a bug, uh, it's a reptile. So let me show you some other examples. Here's another bug that is pretty well, you know, kind of blended in. And this is my favorite one because here it's really hard to see <clears throat> the bug. So before we go through, you know, 300 pictures uh, that uh, I think you got the key message here, which is bugs don't jump at you from the code. You really have to look at the code understanding uh, and, uh, and get some context in order to be able to tell whether something's buggy or not. Third assumption was that programmers inspect the list uh, <clears throat> linearly and exhaustively. So you can give a long list uh, of statements uh, <clears throat> ranked by suspiciousness, and they, the, the developers will just go through these statements uh, and one by one until they find the bug. <clears throat> and this is good for comparison, because if I have two techniques and I want to see whether one technique is better than the other, of course, if mine technique ranks the, the, the faulty statement higher than yours, my technique is better. But is it realistic? So we were wondering, does the conceptual model make sense and have we really evaluated it? And that's, uh, you know, it, it led to the more general question, are we headed in the right direction? And this is what led basically to uh, my work with Chris. Uh, so we, we, we really produced two, two pieces of work. Uh, the first one is the ISTA paper that I'm uh, discussing today that we also did some follow-up work in which we looked at the broader set of techniques. But today, of course, I'm gonna focus on the first one. So as I was saying, we started from the question of how much do we really know about automated debugging techniques and their effectiveness? So as a starting point, we wanted to assess the balance between analytical studies performed purely on tools and studies that involve actual users. So we looked at the literature. So we have 50 years of research on automated debugging <clears throat> going from the, you know, the uh, 1962 symbolic debugging uh, to uh, you know, statistical debugging, delta debugging, and so on. And we noticed that uh, the balance is heavily tipped towards studies on tool. And in fact, we found that only a handful of user studies had been presented. And even more interestingly, uh, the majority of these uh, studies reported negative results pretty much. So they, they showed that the technique was not effective when evaluated with real users. So that's when we really decided that we wanted to uh, perform a user study to understand how these current rank-based tools based on statistical localization worked in practice and could actually help uh, programmers. So what we did, uh, we first uh, built an Eclipse plugin. Uh, the plugin uh, was uh, performing statistical localization and then it was showing the results to the developers so that they could click on them. And if they clicked on them, it would have brought them to the uh, right uh, place uh, in, the, in the source code. We also had like login facilities. So we were kind of monitoring what the developers were doing while using this plugin. And we performed a, a user, set of user studies to investigate four research questions. The first one was whether programmers who use automated debugging tools locate bugs faster uh, and more effectively than programmers who don't, do not use such tools. So basically, are these tools useful? The second one 
it was whether the effectiveness of debugging with automated tools was affected by the uh, faulty statement rank. Since this is all rank based, does it make a difference if something is ranked higher or lower? Uh, the research question was about uh, whether developers navigate a list of statements ranked by suspiciousness in the order provided. And finally, we wanted to assess whether perfect bug understanding exists. So I'm going to describe uh, you know, the, our experimental protocol, so uh, starting from the setup. Uh, we selected uh, 34 participants, uh, developers that were uh, master students. Uh, they were coming with different levels of expertise. Uh, some had worked in industry, some had done multiple internships, some only had done class projects. So that was good for the study because it allowed us to basically uh, divide them into low, medium, and high performance groups. We consider two tools. One is the basically the, the, the tool, the automated debugging tool, the rank based one, the Eclipse plugin plus the login facilities. And the alternative was basically to just do traditional debugging. We just told the participants, do debugging any way you want and you're used to. Use print statements, uh, the ID debugger, whatever works for you. As software uh, benchmarks, uh, we use two programs, uh, Tetris and NanoXML. They all, they both contain one fault. Uh, the Tetris bug, I mean, I'm assuming, first of all, that you know, everybody is familiar with Tetris and they play, play Tetris at least once in their life. And you know, if you, if you play the rotating square, it should have no effect on the position of the square. And instead, in this case, the uh, rotation of the square was causing the square to move. I consider this to be an easy bug because Tetris is well understood, uh, the code was smaller, and also it's pretty clear what's going on here in terms of the failure. The bug in NanoXML was a little trickier <clears throat> because it was like a suitably crafted uh, input could crash NanoXML. And we consider this harder because uh, parsers are harder to understand uh, than games. Uh, and also it's not immediately clear when you look at the, the failure, what's going on uh, with the program. We defined two tasks. The first one was finding the fault in Tetris. The second one finding the fault in NanoXML. We gave 30 minutes uh, uh, for each task to the participant. And we had a questionnaire uh, at the end in which we were collecting impressions of the tool, descriptions of the fault, uh, and, uh, and fix plus any other comments that they might have. Uh, we had you know, two studies, so there, was a, there were two parts. Uh, for the first, uh, first part, we had two groups. Group A was debugging Tetris with the tool and uh, uh, NanoXML in a traditional way, and group B was doing the opposite. For the second part, uh, instead, what we did, we gave the tool to everybody. So uh, group, C, uh, group C and D were both uh, uh, debugging Tetris and NanoXML. But in the first case, uh, uh, for, D, for group D, we lowered the rank of the faulty statement uh, in Tetris from position 7 to 35, and we bumped up the rank of the statement uh, in NanoXML from 83 to 16. So we basically multiply and divide it by five because we wanted to see whether that was causing some effect in the uh, performance of the, uh, the debugging task. So let me show you the results uh, of the study for the four groups. So for each pair of groups and tasks, uh, I will show you whether the performance of the two groups was significantly different uh, in a statistical sense. So whether they, they found more bugs and they find them quicker uh, in, uh, in the two cases. And we're going to start uh, by looking at the performance of groups A and B for Tetris. And for instance, in that case, our results indicated there were basically no statistically significant differences <clears throat> between the performance of the two groups. And unfortunately, this was the case for all tasks and groups. So we didn't find any difference for any of the tasks and groups. There was a silver lining though, because when we looked at the results in more detail, and stratified the participants, we found that the most expert developers did perform better on Tetris when using the tool than when not using the tool, and which, which is great because it you know, showed that the tool was useful. However, that did not really happen for the reason that one might imagine, and uh, I will explain that uh, shortly. So after you know, analyzing these results and looking at the questionnaires, we were able to answer our research question and to draw some conclusions. So in terms of research questions, uh, uh, are these tools uh, uh, useful? And the answer is uh, yes, with caveats, in the sense that experts were faster when using the tool in one case, but that didn't really happen in general. Is the effectiveness of debugging with automated tools affected by the faulty statement rank? And in this case, uh, the answer was uh, no, because we didn't see any significant difference in the performance when lowering or you know, raising the, the rank. Do developers navigate a list of statements ranked by suspiciousness in the order provided? And here, what we noticed uh, was basically that in general, users gave up on the list uh, after just a few entries 
they were false positives. And then they started debugging in other ways. And in some cases, they didn't even look at, uh, at the list. They were basically just started debugging. And this is also when we realized the reason why the high performance had done well with Tetris. Because what they did uh, was that instead of going through the list, they made their hypothesis of what was wrong with the code. So they figured out it had to do with rotation and they just searched through the list until they found the first statement that was defined in a method that had to do with rotation. And immediately, bang, they found the problem in no time. So they were able to uh, kind of leverage the list uh, to, uh, to drive, uh, you know, based, uh, and, and, and to look at the code based on their uh, hypothesis. So programmers do not visit each statement in the list, but rather they search. And finally, uh, for a research question four, does perfect bug understanding uh, exist? So in order to do this, we looked at the logs and we looked at the time between when uh, uh, a participant clicked on the faulty statement and the time in which they declared that they found the fault in, uh, in their report. And we noticed that there was a, you know, a kind of 10 minutes on average. And, and this you know, can be a, you know, a fairly long time, especially if you think about the kind of a, a long list of statements, but definitely shows that, that it's not enough to look at the statement to decide whether it's faulty or not, which was not surprising to us. So the answer here is perfect bound understanding is generally not a realistic assumption. Uh, based on the uh, answer to the research question, we also uh, the, presented some research implications and some recommendations. So the first one is that percentages will not cut it. Uh, so, for example, uh, the 83rd position in NanoXML corresponds to 1.8% of the code. So, clearly, percentages will give you a misleading picture. So, techniques uh, should focus on improving absolute rank rather than percentages. Ranking can be successfully combined with search, as, which is what we, uh, we saw happening. So, future tools might want to try to do that. For example, allowing to search through or automatically highlighting certain suspicious statements. Uh, developers want explanation, not recommendation. This was clear from the questioners. They didn't like the idea of just being provided a list with no additional information. So we should, the recommendation and the implication is that we should move away from pure ranking and define techniques that provide context and ability to explore. Uh, we must keep developers in the loop. Uh, so with, based on what we observed, uh, we were pretty convinced that we should create techniques that amplify rather than fully replacing uh, human skills. And finally, on the, more on the engineering side, Techniques do not work in a vacuum. So research, if they want this tool to be effective, should really focus on providing an ecosystem that supports uh, the entire tool chain for fault uh, localization. So this was the paper, basically the findings. And so now let's look at the future or uh, you know, really back to the future because I have the luxury of talking about the future that already happened. So there's nothing better than talking about the future with hindsight. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to discuss uh, the impact uh, of the paper and possibly also mention some uh, kind of uh, open issues that are you know, that kind of uh, relevant uh, today uh, as well. And so let me start by discussing the impact of the paper in terms of numbers, something with the number of citations. So what we did, we scraped data uh, from various sources, which I have to say was pretty painful. And we computed the number of citations per year uh, for the paper, which I'm showing here. And we were definitely happy to see that the paper uh, keeps being cited uh, uh, today. So that, uh, that, that was really good news that you know, it looks like it, it is uh, still relevant uh, 10 years after it was published. Then we wanted to see where we are cited. So analyzing our citations, we found that we are cited in over 100 unique venues, which is kind of surprising and interesting to see. Uh, and uh, I'm representing here the venues uh, in percentage terms. So we only uh, representing data for conferences and journals, so we're not counting uh, thesis or, or, or dissertations in this case. Uh, and uh, you can see that you know that, that you know that, that the number is going from you know higher to uh, to lower. I'm going to point out uh, uh, you know a few uh, of these venues. In particular, I'm going to start with ISTA, of course. And you can see that ISTA is in second position, despite the fact that it's fairly uh, or relatively small uh, conference with uh, uh, almost 10% of the citations. Then uh, the position one is uh, ICSI. With almost 15% of the citations. And if you go down the list, uh, you can see that the paper was cited to different extent in most major software engineering uh, venues, uh, both conferences and journals. And in case you care for the distinction, uh, we also kind of provide the information that 59% of the citations were conferences, 27% journals, and 4% uh, magazines. And we actually appreciate that you know, being cited in magazine because that you know, typically shows that you know, many people are, are actually reading uh, your paper. And just out of curiosity, we also looked at the authors who cited us. 
and so that the, we were cited by over 700 uh, unique authors, which was also kind of surprising. And, uh, and when, then we checked uh, who were the top uh, three citers, uh, if nothing else, to thank them for, uh, you know, for all the citations. And uh, so uh, in third position, you can see that we have uh, Liming Zhang, now at UIUC. Uh, in second position, we have Rui Abreu, which was not surprising because they've done uh, you know, a lot of research in this area. <clears throat> and finally, first position by far is David Law which is also not surprising as he has done a lot of work uh, uh, in this area as well. Uh, and uh, in fact, you know, we had several discussions over the years about the effectiveness of statistical localization. And you know, we don't necessarily kind of uh, share the same opinion, but we definitely discussed it uh, multiple times. And there is one paper in particular from David and his colleagues that I would like to mention uh, here. And this is the paper, Automated Debugging Considered Harmful, Consider Harmful, uh, kind of a uh, uh, nice uh, and uh, smart title. And what this paper did was to take a, a critical look at our work and uh, by performing a follow-up study with real developers, more fault, more fault and larger systems. And the results were pretty interesting, if nothing else, because you can, as I said, it was a more extensive study and also because uh, it did not always align with uh, our results. So it was painting a rosier picture in terms of the effectiveness of these techniques. But it was also interesting to see that, you know, it actually confirmed the several of our findings in this setting. For example, developers did give up on the ranked list after a handful of, of false positives. Uh, developers uh, did combine the entries in the ranked list with searches based on their hypothesis. And also, you know, it confirmed that based on the way uh, developers were using the, the tool that the fact that there is really no perfect bug uh, understanding. So it was, it was good to see that even within some differences, some of the results were, were confirmed. And overall, I have to say, we really appreciate this kind of work and believe that more of these studies are needed, whether they confirm or disprove our findings. So in addition to you know, this specific paper, we also look at the number of other papers uh, that have cited our work because we wanted to assess whether you know, we were just being cited, whether there were just you know, sheer numbers of our work had an actual impact on subsequent uh, research. And we were actually very pleased to identify <clears throat> impact or potential impact along several directions. So pretty much nowadays, uh, uh, all papers on software for localization have adopted absolute evaluation metrics, whether it's wasted effort, accuracy at N uh, or, or similar. So nobody's using, or pretty much nobody is using percentages anymore. We also identify several approaches that focus on improving result comprehensions by providing fault explanation and or context and cited our paper as motivation. So it was very rewarding. Uh, we also saw some user studies, so more than what we had before, although we would really like to see uh, even more uh, with the understanding that you know, doing user studies is, is, is very difficult and time consuming, uh, of course. And finally, we saw <clears throat> the presentation of several interactive approaches with humans in the loop, which again was something that we <clears throat> recommended and uh, uh, this paper was citing our work as a motivation for, for that. So uh, maybe <clears throat> these researchers would have done it anyways, but of course we like to think that our work played a role in this and in shaping the direction of the, of the area in the subsequent years. We also want to mention, uh, to be fair, the part of our work that had limited or no impact. And, and the first thing is kind of the other side of the coin. So user studies, we really hope to see many more user studies than the ones we saw. So we encourage everybody to do more. And also, only a few people picked up on the idea of the ecosystem, so uh, which is kind of understandable because uh, <clears throat> building ecosystem requires a lot of engineering and doesn't always pay off in terms of uh, publication. So it's not something that researchers uh, might be uh, keen to do. But those were the kind of the two main areas that we uh, identified. And before moving to the next uh, topic, I would really like to uh, give a shout out to Ang, Perrins, Van Dersen, and Abreu for their paper that was entitled Revisiting the Practical Use of Automated Software Fault Localization Techniques. This paper performed a similar kind of analysis and uh, luckily reached a similar conclusions to the one that I just presented. And we really appreciate the fact that they put a lot of work into this paper and made our life easier in preparing this talk by giving us a great uh, starting point. So thanks and kudos to them for doing this work. Which is also kind of fairly humbling to see, I have to say. So why did we think we, we had impact? Uh, why, why did the paper uh, was, well, was well received? And uh, we, we think that you know, <clears throat> the work, one of the first reasons was the work that was timely and relevant. 
Many people were working on a software for localization at the time, and so they were very interested in seeing our findings. Even more uh, importantly, we really took a different perspective and looked at the problem of software for localization from the user standpoint, which was not that common at the time. So uh, everything was based on basically trying to improve the ranking and nobody was doing, really looking at you know, the perspective of people actually using the tool. We also think it was very important that we presented actionable findings, so really actionable findings, that is uh, recommendations that could be applied uh, right away. And uh, we also released all of our study data, which was also not that common at, uh, at the time. And finally, uh, we think that one of the reasons why the paper uh, uh, was kind of uh, generated interest was because it touched a live nerve in the sense that many researchers at that point uh, were sort of tired of seeing uh, more and more instances of SFL techniques uh, without some deeper understanding of whether and how these techniques worked. And I say here for better or worse, because uh, I have to say that some of the people working in this area felt initially attacked uh, by the work. Uh, and although I, I like to believe that eventually, and also <clears throat> based on conversation, I believe that eventually they appreciated our intent uh, and uh, ultimately this, uh, this work. So let me conclude the presentation with some uh, uh, final words. Uh, so uh, in summary, uh, I really think that we came a long way since the early days uh, of debugging. So now we have a number of techniques uh, that can help debugging and on which we can build. So we can extend them, we can combine them, uh, we can modify them. And this includes slicing based techniques, statistical debugging, delta debugging, so all the techniques that I mentioned and more because uh, there's really kind of a rich set of research uh, approaches to debugging. And uh, even automatic repair actually, because I mean, there's a kind of very interesting interplay between automatic replay and full localization and the kind of they play off uh, uh, each other. So combination of the two are also very interesting and very promising. At the same time, as you know, there's also a fairly still long way to go, which is definitely good news for researchers because uh, you know, we'll have uh, uh, work to do. And so what I wanna do, I'm gonna just conclude with a, a quick takeaway message uh, like kind of in three main parts. The first one is to be careful and honest with your assumptions. And uh, when the point here is that when you define a new approach, completely new approach, it's fine to have strong assumptions and to kind of uh, address the reduced version of the program just to see whether you know, the idea is good and it works and so on. But as something becomes more and more popular, it's really important to think about why is the approach working? Uh, what are the assumptions that are being made? Are they realistic? Can I relax some? And so on. So the, uh, the, our experience with, with our work with this paper was it's really important to do this kind of reasoning. Uh, also, don't pursue uh, full automation at all costs. Uh, I, I really feel strongly about this point, which I think is true for software engineering in general and maybe other areas as well. So don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So sometimes we strive for full automation because I mean, I understand it is more appealing. But at the same time, I think we are letting on the table a lot of very good opportunities of techniques that could just uh, take what the user has to provide interactively and basically give back much more. As I was saying before, amplifying rather than replacing the users. The users. And I think this is a very important point. And uh, you know, along similar lines, keep the user in mind. Uh, we software engineers, we people doing testing and analysis, in many cases, we are developing tools and techniques that are gonna eventually be used by some end users, whether they are developers, testers, uh, uh, just end users in general. And so we have to keep in mind that you know, they, these tools will be used by somebody. So we have to keep in mind, both in the way we define the techniques and in the way we evaluate them, uh, that you know, there's gonna be some humans that are gonna use these techniques and we're gonna try to make them work for uh, them. And uh, this is all I had. I just wanna conclude uh, with an acknowledgement slide uh, in which uh, I want to thank folks who contributed one way or the other to this work and, uh, and this presentation. And with that, I'm more than happy to take questions.